Hello and welcome to another beautiful time on Executive Discuss, which is coming to you on the network service of the NTA. My name is Olola Diadini Jadili. This week's episode of the program is a particularly special one because um, I'm honored to have a guest whom, for someone that I've been looking forward to having a chat with for several years now. And um, well, today I have found that opportunity. He is a man who has served this nation at the highest levels that you can ever think of. He is a man who has defended the integrity, the sovereignty and the unity of Nigeria. In fact, sometime um, in the year 1969, he took a bullet for this great country, Nigeria, for us to remain one indivisible entity. And he later went on to rise through the ranks to become the head of states. Of course, he was uh, known as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Please join me because it's a great honor to have with us today His Excellency, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, GCFR. Hello, sir. How are you? You're most welcome. Thank you. Yes, sir. Finally, good to have you here. Thank you. One thing has always intrigued me about you because I'm um, growing up, yes, I saw a fine gentleman, a fine soldier. And I always asked myself, why did you go into the military? What was it about the military that attracted you? Well, initially, military was not part of my thoughts when I was growing up. But the political environment at that time made the whole thing different. Uh, we, when I was about to finish secondary school, at that time, I'm talking about early 60s, 61, 62, there was a deliberate policy in the country at that time to recruit officers from this part of the country because in their own wisdom they thought they are not well represented in the military. Mm. So they decided that uh, people who attain that level of education should be recruited into the Nigerian Military Training College. So they took a deliberate drive to go and make us interested in joining the military. Mm. And that is what brought me and some of my colleagues into the military profession. There was uh, a lot of campaign to recruit, to get us interested in the army. We had, I had, for example, General Yakubu Gawan, who was then just coming out a professional young soldier who was used to go and teach other students that if once you enroll into the army, this is the sort of rank you are going to have. Mm. We were all uh, fascinated by seeing General Gawan in uniform, a young Gawan mm. um, in his uniform, smartly dressed, and a lot of us became interested in And that carried a lot of us to the army. Mm. Now, while in the army, you held some command positions and um, you must have had um, quite some interesting time. Can you share with us some of these um, unique command positions you held and how they impacted your life? Well, first of all, when we went into the army, we were recruited as cadets, mm. people who will go to train to become army officers in the Nigerian army. Um, I remember during our time there are about 14 or 15 of us from the same class who went into the army and uh, we met others from other institutions who also came from different parts of the country and they joined us and uh, we became what we were known as Nigerian Military Training College Course 5. Hmm. There were other courses, one, two, three, four, five. I was six, mm. and my classmates were course six. And we trained in Kaduna mm. for a couple of months, and then we got reposted out of the country 
Some of us went to India. I went to India, okay. for example. Others went to London, Sandhurst. Some went to Pakistan. Some went to Ethiopia. And uh, quite a lot of different countries for the purposes of becoming army officers. Hmm. And so having trained in India, because I know that um, the Indian army is, um, you know, one that's um, acclaimed to be very good. Having trained um, in India, how did this impact your life as an officer? Well, it's basically this. Historically, India had just come out of a war with, the, with China. China. In the 60s, 62, 63. So because it went through a war, it had to change a lot of training, indoctrination, mm -hmm. all sorts of new things have to come in. And because of the environment, the training there in India was very, very tough mm -hmm. because it was we were trained under a war condition. They wanted us, from their experiences during the war, yes. they wouldn't like it to happen again. So a lot of training has to change mm -hmm. to accommodate the new environment mm. and it was really really tough and they pay a lot, they paid a lot of attention then in the physical fitness okay and the mental, the mental. alertness of uh, the cadets and we had to go through all that as if we were going through a war and not in any way were you deterred, maybe because of the trainings you had to undergo then? No, I remembered also, just to give you the example, there are over 500 of us, and I think not more than two to three hundred were able to go through. At the end of it all. Mm -hmm. Now, um, just like I said in my um, introduction <coughs> of the program, you were a young officer during the war in Nigeria, and in 1969, you took a bullet to the right side of your chest. You had an opportunity for it to be removed, but you refused. And um, I don't know if you still wear that shrapnel till today. The shrapnel is still on, and that proved the doctor right, mm. because I asked him. I was in the university, Lagos University Teaching Hospital, he told me there, and my question is, if, I, if it's there, what is the implication effect on me? He said, presently, there should be no problem whatsoever. Uh, but as you develop in age, it may have some effect on you on something. Mm. Fortunately, I still feel that shrapnel is lying down comfortably oh. in part of my... <laughs> comfortably? Yes, because it doesn't give me any problem. The only problem is maybe if I try to walk across a place where you have uh, detectors, metal okay, detectors, uh -huh. it makes a small noise and they uh, check. In, in those days before I used to travel with a small card, I show them and... Mm. I and you're allowed, allowed to, to go. Yeah. But the idea that you even considered leaving it there, why? Because I was scared of surgery. Uh, what did you just say? I was scared of surgery. A fine soldier. Yeah. A military man who has experienced so much, who has seen so much. Scared of surgery. That soldier, a military man, is also a human being. I find that very hard to believe. He's a human being, it's human nature. Yes, I know.
Now, um, you started the, um, you, you, you joined the military as a young man there. You saw the likes of um, uh, Gowan, like you said, and you were interested. He helps to build part of your interest. But along the line, we discovered that it looked like you were well liked by the top echelon of the military. I mean, at different times, I've seen uh, pictures of you with uh, President Obasanjo, um, General Danjuma, and so many. Even uh, President Buhari, I think maybe you were playing drafts or something. Now, also, there's been this stories that not one, maybe if, if we had one, of the coups in Nigeria that did not have your imprint. What was this about? Was it as a result of your bravery or because you were so well liked or what? No, I think uh, I have had to explain that one a, a couple of times. I think because of the environment I found myself hmm. within the military profession, I belong to and what I will call an elite Core. and it's our dream. So there are a lot of us there who were all together, we grew up together, and we served in different places. So I got to know a lot of people as a result of interaction and in, as a result of the type of core I decided to work in, in the military. And um, you became a master coup plotter? I wouldn't like that, master coup plotter, but a participant in coups, not a plotter. <laughs> a participant, okay, so a master participant. A participant. <laughs> All right, when you um, took over power in 1985, um, shortly after you began to be addressed as the president rather than the head of state that perhaps we were used to. What informed this decision to hold this title as president? Well, I, a lot of things. It's more or less academic. Um, mm. When we came in, we knew from General Agui, Iran, C. Subsequently, people came, they have been referred to as head of state, supreme commander, mm. supreme military council, <laughs> all that, you know, and it's academic. We just decided, no, only God is supreme. Mm. So we find a way of removing that supreme Pre thing, um, head of state. We knew time was changing. At the time we came, there yes. was a change in and the, um, the old military, gov the government, the environment is changing very fast. Mm. Um, and we knew that the military was going to be no longer an issue in politics. Okay. So we knew that uh, at that time, in 1976, when Murtala Mohammed came out with a program, was introducing a presidential system of government. of government. So we wanted Nigerians to get used to what to expect. We don't want to change the whole thing, but to have a transition program that will culminate into a presidential system, system of government. Of so why not? The head of that company should be a president. So the participants of the coup, to quote you now, <laughs> decided that the best thing is to say a military president. Military president. You are all aware of the circumstances which led to the change in the leadership of the government of this country, and I need not to repeat it here. Let me first of all congratulate all of you for a well-deserved appointment as members of the Armed Forces Ruling Council, a body which now replaces the former Supreme Military Council as the highest ruling organ of government. 
your selection was made on your personal merit and experience and not because you represent sectional or particular geographical areas of the country. I hope, therefore, that you will justify the confidence reposed in you. As members of the highest ruling organ of government, you are directly in the focus of the keen and watchful eyes of the public for your conduct of public affairs, your utterances and general behavior. I, therefore, expect of all of you at all times loyalty, good conduct and exemplary leadership qualities. I equally expect of you to be above board and render selfless service to the nation. Your style of governance, I mean, when you were the president, you, it was military, it was a military regime, but you also worked with civilians. Um, in fact, at some point, I think you even had um, a national assembly. Why did you decide to toe that line? Was it that you were laying the foundation for what we presently enjoy today as a democratic governance, or what was it about? My answer is yes. We knew then that time will come, we had to leave. There, is, there has been a lot of pressure in the whole world for a change. Soviet Union was changing, mm. Glasnost, Perestroika and all that. Yes. We didn't want Nigeria to be left behind in this because it will have some international repercussion. So we decided to go along the line that the world was going. Mm. And that was what also informed your decision to have, um, at some point, a civilian attorney general? Yes. Um, we knew we have to operate within the law. And we are not trained lawyers. Mm. We need somebody who will advise us on what we are intending to do so that we don't breach the laws. And you find that quickly, we decided to bring in an attorney general who will always be present in our meetings. If we are on the right course, he will say, no, this goes contrary to the law to the and point. so on. And I found that very instructive and very useful too. General Ibrahim Babangida, at the time that um, you were in government, a lot of, um, yes, military rules were referred to as dictatorships. So, well, we, it was believed that you were running a military dictatorship. But I also know that you worked with the Armed Forces Ruling Council. So, how much of a dictatorship was it really? Well, when you say dictatorship, unless you look at it from the point of view of the fact that all our decisions, we subject them to a lot of debate, mm a lot of discussions. If you had an opportunity to listen to us in the Armed Forces Ruling Council, everybody is allowed to talk. Everybody is allowed to have an opinion. Everybody is allowed to hold on to his own opinion. Hmm. And everybody should subject himself to the majority. We operated simply like civilians is going because it is all about people. Mm. You are doing it not for yourselves, but, for but you country. are doing it for the people. Mm. So the pe you have to carry them along all the time. We t I tried to talk to you when there is something important that we needed a decision on it. I give you the example of the IMF debate, um, uh, some debates also about issues that touch on Nigeria and about political parties, for example. We subjected the country to discussions about what sort of parties, what sort of government that we want this country to have. And we allowed Nigerians to express themselves, which they are excellent, they are masters mm. in expressing themselves. <laughs> Whether you like it or, or not, not, they will still talk. <laughs> So we gave them, we provided an environment for them to talk. From there, we knew what their feelings are. What we came out with represents the feeling of, of the, people. the people. So we can't go wrong. There was um, an interview you granted um, 
And just to lend credence to the question, I want to ask that at some point in time, you were accused of not um, obeying the rules of ethnic balance in some of your appointments. Right. And I recall that um, you made a statement about um, not, not sacrificing seniority, training and the likes. Can you please shed light on this? Well, I think um, in the military profession, we don't look at those as major consideration. Okay. <clears throat> we take people based on seniority, like you said, competence, mm. loyalty to the profession, and live above board ordinarily. You must have certain principles that you stick to. If you have habits that are disruptive to the, com to the profession, yes. um, no matter the ethnic part of the country you belong, we wouldn't consider you for anything. These people were not used to it, but we were s s very, very strict in some of these issues. We believe that we will not compromise seniority, experience, training, for the sake of satisfying these uh, balancing, if you will call it that way. So you find it, this thing keeps on changing. If they were Northerners in 1990, you find that in 1992 they are not. And this we accept as our own way of life. So the senior, the best, gets in there at all the time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can watch ATA International live on your TV, computer, iPad, tablet and phone. Log on to visiontv.co.uk and click on entertainment, then NTAI. You can also download the iOS or Android app on your mobile devices to watch NTA International on the go, anywhere in the world. NTA International, your window to the world. You worked with what I would want to describe as some of the best brains around at that time. You had the likes of uh, Professor Lukui Ransom Kuti, uh, Pao Sokibu, Alaji Alaji. How were you able to identify and harness these brains to be able to deliver what was required? During the course of my profession in the military, I came a lot of across a lot of very, very brilliant Nigerians mm. who made names within their profession. We interacted with them in conferences in Lagos, in conferences outside Lagos, and so on and so forth. So personally, everybody who served with me, I knew him before he became on board to, to, work, with you. to work with me. You mentioned Ransom Kuti. I will give you a story. Please do. One day he came to Joss. I was a student of the Nigeria Institute for Policy and, and Strategic, Strategic Studies. Studies. He came and talked to us. We had a habit. If an instructor came, he talked to us, we assess him. Okay. When he's gone, we can sit and say, no, this man is a joker, or this man mm. is a good. <laughs> and we assess them. Ransom Kuti came, he talked to us. A lot of us, some of my classmates at that time were heads of service permanent secretaries, director generals, uh, state chief executives, and so on. So we found him one of the best lecturers that we have at that time. Mm. When I wanted him to come and join us, I sent for him because I wouldn't allow it just to be announced in the media. So I had to talk to him. He came and I told him what I wanted. He looked at me, he said, military. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> I knew he might reject it because of so many reasons that I know. Mm. Um, he has brothers who are very good 
social critics, critics in the society. Oh. They may not allow him to do that. Hmm. So I said, okay. He, he was very smart. He was very polite. He said, okay, Mr. President, I am going to consult. Hmm. I will consult my wife. So I said, Prof, tell her we, we don't accept no as an answer. He said, yes, he will tell her. So I told him, I reminded him, I said, you can't afford to tell me no, no. because you were there in Joss. Uh -huh. I told him the date. I told him when he talked about, about the country. I said, if you believe in what you are teaching us, then you should accept this job. He said, teaching you how? Uh -huh. I said, you visited us at the highest institute and you, this is what you told us about primary health care. Oh, goodness. And we wanted you to come and implement what you believe in. Mm. Now, you can't afford to tell me no, otherwise I will have a different opinion about you when we all assess to you the best. You held him by the jugular. He shook his head. <laughs> he said, you are in that class? Naturally. I said, yes, I was. He came back. He said... Uh, well, Mr. President, I will come on board. Mm. I thanked him, and I'm glad that he did, because this country till today, yes. they still work on the policy that uh, he has worked yes. with us in the country. Mm. One of your greatest critics then, too, was um, Professor Tai Shularin, and you eventually worked with him on People's Bank. Why? How? He's passionate about the ordinary people, mm. the downtrodden. And uh, we thought we should convince him to give him a job that has to do with what he believes in. And the one we did, he quickly came on board. I enjoyed working with him, I must tell you. Mm. Mm -hmm. But um, he resigned after a while. I think this is typical Nigerian. It's not us that uh, forced him out. It is you, the Nigerians, that forced him out. How? I, don't, I believe you begin to think that he, now does, he no longer practices what he believes in uh, because he is working for the military sort of thing. And I think he became sensitive to it, that he's no longer for the masses. Mm. And the Nigerian, thanks to active media that we have, the Nigerian media will not, it was not in a position, or the Nigerian uh, elites were not in a position to give, say, wait a minute, what is this guy doing? doing. Let's assess him based on what he's doing or what he's trying to do. Oh, typical Nigerian, oh yes, he's with them, that's all. They bought him, they settled him. You know, those things are not complimentary for people like uh, Taishalari. Your Excellency, him. was it not a case of him having been a critic and now being called to do the job yeah. and unable to um, stay in the kitchen because it's too hot? Yeah, w unless you bring him, he wouldn't know the kitchen is hot. Mm. Unless he gets to the kitchen. <laughs> now he did. And it's not easy. He's meeting the Nigerian attitude, the Nigerian psyche. I have always said, if I tell a Nigerian my name is Ibrahim, the first thing is no, he is not. And this is the name that my father gave me. But the Nigerian must argue that it's not my father who gave me that name. Maybe it's my mother or my <laughs> uncle or my grandfather and so on. Okay. Now you moved the seat of power from Lagos to Abuja. And um, I believe it's safe to say that about, if not more, than 70% of the structures that are today standing in Abuja um, as a seat of power, which identify it as a seat of power, 
were constructed by you. But I also recall that at that time, it looked like we were going through some economic challenges. Why did you move at that time? Why did you decide that, okay, enough of the dilly-dally, let's go? Well, okay, historically, the decision to move to Abuja, a new capital, was a decision taken by another government mm -hmm. and is a welcome decision. Mm -hmm. So mine was to implement that decision. And we really, if you look at the argument that the Murtala administration put for Forward. the need for a new capital, it was even more apparent now then in the 80s and late 80s, it was much more apparent. So based on that, we said the best thing is to hasten the movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we did it. You also, um, to a large extent, completed the Ajaokuta Steel Rolling Mill. Mm -hmm. You took up some major projects. And still at that time, we were groaning, kind of. Economic challenges. Yeah. Well, you talked earlier about some of the brightest people mm -hmm. that I had. Mm -hmm. Those bright people helped me a lot to get the government to achieve this with the minimum resources that we had at that time. Mm. It's all economic management. Okay, so you were able to do these things without necessarily majorly harming the economy? No. Abuja, Ajaokuta, those are the contentious issues that we had at that time. But it's like Pennywise pound foolish, if I may use that phrase. The amount of money we sunk into Ajaokuta, for example, I think it, it's, it will be criminal if we will just abandon it after spending billions and billions of dollars to develop that outfit only to come and throw it out. In spending on transport and roads, the government also felt there was limited scope for cutbacks. Modern facilities were needed. So work went ahead on the third mainland bridge in Lagos, completed in 1991. It was part of an improved road network, including the Benin Wari Highway and many others. Now, moving on, the Structural Adjustment Program, SAP. For me, the way I look at it is that um, it's a case of um, different strokes for different folks. Uh, because for some people, yes, quite a lot of people were groaning, but it also seemed to bring out the can-do spirit of Nigerians. But despite the grumblings at that time, why did you decide to pursue that program? Because I believe exactly in what you just talked about, the Nigerian. He is a very, very bright person, mm. a very resilient person, mm. and uh, is prepared to do anything that will be good for him mm. and for the country. Okay. Now, that's no, number one. Number two. We also knew, because I was working with these bright guys, we knew that it was not going to be easy because it is going to change the whole life, uh, the consumption attitude of Nigeria. Yes. It has to change. Uh, you have to use brain and your hands if you want to survive. Mm. I said it in one of my budget speeches, that if you are prepared to work hard, you will survive the time. The time is not going to be easy. Hmm. But I knew you, Nigerians, you are very determined people who like challenges. And I know a lot of you will succeed in this program. Those who are not ready to work as hard will drop off. We'll by the so we were side. honest enough, we said it. So we prepared the minds of all of the Nigerian people that this is what is going to happen. And uh, 
those who survived or those who were strong enough are still surviving up till now hmm. and are doing very well. And those who are not fell by the wayside. By the wayside. I don't understand how anybody can object to it. I mean, it's cutting your coat according to your size, very elementary economics, and uh, actually challenging the lost creativity of this country. I mean, I know many, many productive areas where people who formerly didn't even think they had it in them, you know, which, in which they have you know, really thriven. I mean, I've, I've seen it. I know examples, lots and lots of examples. Before the social abortion program came, I don't use any car more than two years. Once I use a car for two years, two and a half years, I think it off by another one. By the, the, the most recent model, and that applies to other Nigerians as well. But you find out now that most of us use cars that are eight years, ten years old. They are there and you keep maintaining. There was no maintenance culture to the extent that every Nigerian now wants to maintain structural abuse program has helped to reorientate the psyche of the average Nigerian. We are now operating in a situation where you are hard working, you get reward for a risk you take. Unlike in the past, we are Few selected individuals were sort of milking the system vis-à-vis -vis their connections on the import license situation, and that has uh, been taken care of. If you are hardworking, had a good background, you're ready to take a risk, you had adequately be rewarded, and I'm uh, I'm a product of that. I should be able to tell you. Also under your administration, I recall very clearly that. Um, a lot of the assembly plants that we had in Nigeria thrived, like Pan, Leyland, Stair, and Co. How were you able to do this for Nigerians? Because we had a lot of Nigerians then become car owners. Well, I think, again, the government at that time, hmm. I will say, had a vision. And we knew we can do a lot of things things that we import, we could do them in the country. Uh, I will give you a very good example. We stopped importation of wheat, for example. And uh, I decided to do that. In, I visited uh, a flour mill. After commissioning it, I gave them the bad news that we are going to stop, we are going to ban Importation, importation of, of wheat. wheat. That wasn't, they didn't take it kindly, mm. but all the same. And we started programs that will make us self sufficient in wheat. Like, uh, I didn't expect that it was going to last because new government is gradually coming in. Mm. A lot of things are changing, and some of these programs are being changed, either their names are being changed or something. Yes. That's a, a typical uh, Nigeria. Nigerian way of doing things. Anyway, I'll now take you to one of, um, something I'll also want to call one of the hallmarks of your administration, the construction of the Third Mainland Bridge, which for a long time remained the longest bridge in Africa. Looking today at um, the economics, looking at the impact that it has had on not just the economy of Lagos, not just the economy of Nigeria, West Africa, and by extension, Africa. Where did that decision come from? I mean, what gave rise to that idea for the construction of such a length of bridge? Did, and did you also have any idea that it was going to be playing this huge role today? National pride mm. was what pushed us to do the third million uh, bridges. You had a program, I think in one of the television, Nigeria squandering of riches, riches or something like that. I saw that program before the takeover. Hmm. There is a program called 60 Minutes. Yes. I saw it and I was mad after watching the television program. There was a Nigerian on the program, I think, Onyeka Owen. My name is Onyeka Owen. 
She was on that program. And I think the compere was an American. He's dead now, I think. He went on the bridge when it was not completed. Okay. He's given it as an example of how African countries conceive programs, uh, elephant, elephant projects. projects. He said, look at this bridge. Hmm. It stopped here. Hmm. Who knows? Maybe it will end up in oblivion. Oh, my. That word pained me a lot. On the CBS show? Yeah. On the CBS show. The whole world is going to see Nigeria hmm. with that impression. Hmm. And when God brought us into office, the first decision we made was that we are going to prove that American broadcaster wrong. wrong. And I talked to my colleagues, hmm. some were not concerned about it. I said, no, this is on our country. It's and about national let's pride. Put it to them that we can do it. That's the first the inspiration hmm. that we have to do that. After that, all we need to do is to ask people how are we going to do, to it? do it? And we sat down, we set a small committee. They sat down together. By then, late Mark Balaji Bank Anthony, mm. his company, Julius Baga, Lego State Government, and so on, put them together and said, I want a solution to this. They came out with a blueprint that, yes, this is doable, but this is the way to do it. I said, well, you guys have to do it. I will provide the support. I will provide the money for the job. And they did quite easily. I even gave them time. Hmm. When we initially put it on, it was it happened to be in August on my birthday. <laughs> and I said, give me a birthday present. present. I will come back to commission this bridge in my next birthday. And behold, thank be to God. They met up our obligations, mm. and we met their obligations. Yes. So we have a third million bridge. But did you see it having this kind of impact? Uh, not as much as it is now, but people talk to me about the impact it is going to make, mm. especially the construction engineers and so on and so forth. Don't mind me, I'll still go back to the third million bridge, but mm. I'm also now, looking back and I'm trying to look at what the situation of Lagos would have been like without a third mainland bridge, having just um, a co-bridge and Qatar bridge catering to the needs of Nigerians there. Maybe you would have established some shanty towns which will not be the best thing for the country. That's one. And the problem we are having now, it will be worse on security of lives and property. And property. Mm. During your time, you deregulated the banks. Was it as um, an economic policy that needed to be done? Or was it that the existing banks at that time were no longer able to perform the functions and going into the new millennium, or what? No, I think it's still to take um, over the responsibilities that normally government would have mm. been handling. Um, government is the financial regulator. Yes. And at that time, we were trying to deregulate the economy. That should include banks. We have people at that time who are bankers capable and so on and could do exactly what the banks are doing now without interference by the, government. by the government. That was what encouraged us to allow them to survive, and I'm glad they did. Was that the same thing for the deregulation of um, the broadcast industry and also the um, tertiary education? That's, the broadcast was even more urgently needed okay. because this is the next phase 
we are going to take the country into democracy. Mm. You need the Nigerians, because they are good, give them a venue to vent out anything they want to talk <laughs> about, to say it without hindrance, mm. to say it without anything. Let them own it. Let them feel they are. And life will flourish. Quite a lot of Nigerians, even people that were not born then, but stories that they had, believed that your administration engendered corruption in Nigeria. But one thing I also know is that um, a lot of the who is who in Nigeria today probably achieved their economic breakthrough when you were in power. How do you marry these two together, the reality against the assertion? Well, I think um, I use, or oh, you, you said engendered corruption. Okay, maybe they will say I established settlements, right? <laughs> That's another way of saying it. Yeah, I knew and I said it. Once you have a government yes. that controls your life, government controls production, mm -hmm. government controls all other aspects of the ordinary Nigerian life, Government should sweep the front of your door. Government should provide you with this to eat. Government will put, put food on your table because it is supposed to be. Then you don't have a country. You should get the people involved themselves. Once you do that, the government, the only job is to watch, to regulate, mm. and make things work well for that thing. This is the way we vision Nigeria is going to be in the future. And we said, okay, we should virtually let everything, let the Nigerian feel he is the Enjoy. master of his own destiny. Don't forget, at that time, we have very, very brilliant businessmen who are doing well. So we should just encourage them. This is an opportunity. We come up with a policy that will make them even richer. And uh, the typical Nigerian, he has a suspicion virtually on every move you make. <laughs> and uh, when you talk about corruption, the best way to find it is to get to where the sin is prevalent and stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, we did this with even in agriculture, by stopping uh, commodity boards, because they are sources of corruption. Um, a cocoa farmer, if you want to grade his cocoa grade one or grade A, you have to bribe him. Now you give him an opportunity to grow your cocoa, take it, go and sell it to people who want it. Let them assess it. If it is good, it's good. If it is bad, it's bad. It's bad. Period. And that's how the whole of this change flourished. But our concept of corruption in the country is different. If he sees me in a good car, oh yes, he's corrupt. If, he's, if I'm a friend of a politician, they will say I'm corrupt because all my friends are uh, politicians. politicians. Uh, so we decided the best way is to go to the root, mm. find out what is attractive thing about this, put an end to it, and allow them to work on themselves. Mm. We are not very, we are not corrupt. I will proudly say it because I read what I read in the papers, if it's true, then I think I used to say we are saints. Hmm. I keep on giving an example. I sacked a governor for 300,000 Naira. Today there are 300 billion. 
still not issued, not solved. All right. Still talking about your time as uh, the president of Nigeria. With the amount of infrastructural development that you were able to bring to Nigeria, the achievements you were able to make, I believe that if there was anyone who could have solved once and for all the past sector challenges of Nigeria, it should have been IBB. What happened? You think so? I believe so. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I believe strongly so. But there are many millions of IBB in Nigeria. I believe there are quite a number of people out there. But it is the Nigerians that will bring them hmm. to do their job. It's about time we started getting to assess people about their competence, about how they can do things, how they will be able to communicate with you, people, to convince you that this is the right thing to do. And it's for you also to believe in what he or she is saying, to go along with that line. And I think if we do the, adopt that attitude, it will be better for the country. What efforts did your administration make to resolve the uh, challenges of power? My administration? Yes. No, is to be open. We, we don't shy away from the problem. Um, I had, for example, um, a presidential advisory committee comprised of, of some of the brightest people in this country. Mm -hmm. We sit together. I used to tell them that, look, you are the experts. The only thing I know is how to kill a man. <laughs> because so, you're a soldier. Yes, that is my profession. And you can't talk to me about it. Mm. I will talk to you about it. You talk to me about your own profession. Mm. The position that God placed me today as the leader is my duty to support you to achieve what we all agree that is best for this country. And they will work people will work mm. and support them, keep on giving them all the support all the time, believe in them, let them also believe in you. And you will find Nigeria is a good country to manage the people. In managing our people, managing our economy, harnessing our resources, oftentimes it's been said that um, the Nigerian economy has defied theories and ideas. What's your take on this? I used to think that way. Um, this is based on what you hear in the media or what you hear the experts are saying. Mm. I did ask one day that from what I have been reading or seeing, the economy would have gone by now. Okay. But why is it still functioning? They will tell you it is the resilience of the ordinary people that is keeping it going. Yeah. Fine, I have no quarrel with that. But it hasn't gone as bad as people predicted. This yeah. would then further strengthen our belief that the Nigerian can do most of this problem by himself, given the right environment, the right leadership, and so on. Looking at you and um, you know your achievements with all of um, the tales that have been told about your administration, it seems to me that Ibrahim Badamus Babangida probably is the most misunderstood president Nigeria has ever had. Hmm. What's your take on this? Misunderstood, yes, I think that is the right phrase. But then I also understand and believe that I will be misunderstood. How? Because Nigerian read motives in virtually everything you do. 
as a leader or as a professional head or something. Mm. The first thing is to say no to you. Once you suggest this is the way to do it, he will say no. He will argue like no man's business. Or where he fails, he tries to attribute that failure to something nubless. You mm. know, he will say no. It's because either he is a Christian or because he is a Muslim or because he is from this part of the country. That attitude, as long as it remains, we still have problem. Mm. Looking at you, you had quite a lot of critics in your time. And I think one of your greatest critics was um, the late Ghani Fawaimi. What kind of relationship did you have with him? I think I, I have a story to that to tell you. Um, but as far as criticism is concerned, the best critic I knew in this country hmm. was a man called Professor Awojobi. He is the best in this country. The best in the sense, this is a scientist, but before he opens his mouth, he studies what he wants to say. He has knowledge on what he wants to say. Hmm. Be it economics, uh, he is an engineer. Be it economics, engineering, or whatever. If Professor Awojobi talks, you know that he is a master in that subject. Mm. He is my best critic that I like in this country. Okay. May he so rest in peace. Okay. As far as Ghani was concerned, I have no, never had problem with Ghani. Mm. He has a very close friend. They are both dead now. Um, Alex Akinyele was Ghani's good friend. He wanted to uh, administer a ceasefire between me and him. I said, I have no problem with that. Because they grew up together, he told me they are friends and so on. And uh, I said, OK, I'll arrange a time. Let's me and see, sit down and see if it, whether we can find an area of common understanding. He tried it. He agreed. Then last minute, he called him, he said, he said, no, I'm not coming to see him. He said, why? Mm. He said, well, they will say he has brought me over, mm. he did this, he did that. So he apologized to Alex. And I said, Alex, yes, I would have been surprised if he allowed you to bring you to me <laughs> because I'm glad he knows that Nigerians could easily misread him and will tarnish his hard and respect right, yes. in the country. So because he's afraid of what Nigerians will say, he decided he will not have that meeting. And I don't grudge him for that because that is the society in which he operates. Mm -hmm. Moving on with this conversation and still talking about your relationships with people, one that I've always wondered about was your relationship with the late General Sani Abaja. I know that you guys grew together in the military. And, um, well, I want to believe that perhaps you were friends till death. We were the best of friends. Till death? Yeah. But a lot of Nigerians thought otherwise. We knew Nigerians thought otherwise. We knew they would think otherwise. Ah. And we decided to capitalize on it and allow you to keep on beating in the bush. <laughs> so you allowed Nigerians to hold that opinion? Yeah. If that pleases them. We, I can tell you that we reach a stage when if you come, somebody wanted to come and see me. He was our common friend. Okay. But he's afraid because they're afraid anybody who came to me would be adjudged as not in good terms. Abacha will be angry. Mm. So he went to him. He said, uh, Look, I want to go and visit Bagwangida and Mina. I hope there is nothing wrong. 
<laughs> Abacha looked at him and said, look, Mr. X, you know, he mm -hmm. calls his name. Yes. He said, I knew, you knew me. But when I introduced to you, to, to me. me, now you are asking me permission to go and see to him. To go and see him. What sort of a human being are you? When I leave this chair, you are going to do the same for the same. The man felt uncomfortable. Hmm. And the following day, Abacha called me and told me, you imagine so, so, and so. He, this is what he told me. I said, no, but you, are you surprised? He said, no. I said, okay, let's leave it, lie down like that. Don't talk to him about it. I'm not going to talk to him about, about it. About it either. If he is happy, so Good be luck it. Good to him. At a time, you were referred to as the evil genius. Hmm? At a time, you were referred to as the evil genius. I'm wondering now, where did this come from? How evil was that genius? It came from the media. Okay, and how evil was the genius? Those are contradictions. A genius can't be an evil man. That geniusness was given to him by God, <laughs> and you can't take it away from him. Did you in any way feel slighted? No. I always ask the interviewer that this is, there is contradiction there, evil and, and then genius. genius. So it's up to you to go and reconcile the two and see if you can change your perception. So, so far, nobody has. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Much as, yes, you rose to the height, the greatest height in uh, Nigerian military, I know that you would have some fond memories of your time in the military. Do you recall of one or two in particular that when you look back, you say, oh, I had a good time in the Nigerian military. Hmm. An event or something? Anything. Not, definitely not about the bullet in your chest anyway. No, no, surely I wouldn't <laughs> like to talk about it too. <laughs> I think the... Military profession has been very kind to me. Uh, in the process, I travel wide this country. I interacted with people. I get to understand people. I get to see people in their own environment, how they behave, and so on. This was only given to me by the military because of postings, because of participating in your own profession. Uh, it, made, it gave me the best, it made the best out of me, the military profession. That's all I could remember, that it made me what I am. <laughs>
24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You can watch NTA International live on your TV, computer, iPad, tablet and phone. Log on to visiontv.co.uk and click on entertainment, then NTAI. You can also download the iOS or Android app on your mobile devices to watch NTA International on the go, anywhere in the world. NTA International, your window to the world. Now I want to um, talk about something and um, I hope you won't in any way feel um, saddened by it. I've never met you, this is my first time, so I will still commiserate with you even though it's been quite a while on the death of um, your wife, Hajia Mariam Babangida. May her soul continue to rest. Amen. What kind of a woman was she? Hmm. A very, very loving woman, very passionate about our relationship and uh, had always wanted the best for me and for her children. You had a lot of military postings. Of course, as a military man, you'll go from one formation to the other. But somehow she was able to hold the home front together. Your children have turned out very well. And um, I'm not sure that at any point in time I've heard of any vices that have been associated with your children. What was it? What do you think it was in her that was able to manage the situation and the home front? I think her sense of discipline. She's fairly very strict of matters that touch on family life and human relationship with uh, people. Uh, what she wanted for her children, she wants the same for other children. And uh, with, but as far as I'm concerned, I think she understands me because it's one of the condition I put jokingly before her, before we got married, you have to accept me for what I am and for whom I am. I wouldn't pretend to do anything new to, bra to please you. So she understood that and that worked very, very well. I will tell you a story that will make you laugh. One day, my Batman, my orderly, innocently brought a letter from my office. That letter came from a girl. And what she did, she opened the letter, she read it. When I came back from office, she put it on top of my dining table. I looked at the letter, I read it. You, you know what happened? No. Once I knew it was the wrong letter, I told her, I said, look, I am sorry, this letter should not have been here in the first place. Mm. The boy I had is a new one. The old boy knew Never the letters bring to bring home. <laughs> this one is just new. So I didn't teach him well. I, she smiled, she said, I am a crook. <laughs> I said, but it wouldn't happen again. I will tell the boy, he should do it like other boys are doing. Mm. If they see wrong letters, they will leave it in the office. Mine, you can bring it. Hers, you can bring it. And it took a man, a woman who understands yes. my way of life to even forgive me. Mm. So I always admit, when I'm wrong, I told her, yes, I'm wrong, you are right here. But what she doesn't believe that, she says, my mother-in-law was the one who spoiled me. I was always right, as far as my mother-in-law is was concerned. concerned. She is wrong, I'm always <laughs> right. And I, I don't take advantage of that much. Yes. But when I see that she is not getting um, agreeable with what I'm saying, 
If I take it to the mother in law, she supports me and I Naturally. tell her, you can go to the <laughs> Good. What can we quantify the service we have rendered for this nation? We have mainstreamed the issues of women into the politics of Nigeria and policies of Nigeria. We have been able to get the women's status raised and thereby the, the, the government from then to now have recognized the strength and capabilities of women, thereby giving them placing them in various positions. Okay. And I'm sure you must have seen the various uh, edifices that we have built. Uh, the National uh, Center for Women Development at the national level and at the state level, we did that. During our tenure, we had 36 uh, directors, all women, and uh, we had uh, the female vice chancellor. So from the beginning, it was a big struggle, and as we went on, uh, people got to understand, people got to participate, and people got to recognize our efforts, and thereby, glory to the Better Life Program. I think you are all enjoying our, our, our work. She was a, a simple woman, but a woman of class, and she brought that touch of class and glamour to the office of the First Lady. She turned that office around completely, so much so that what subsequent First Ladies have enjoyed, the foundations were laid by her. Mm -hmm. The level of importance, the level of intelligence that's attributed to that office. How was she able to do that, even with you being um, in the military and facing Nigeria squarely? Well, I think the other thing, she did a lot of consultations. She has a group mm. of very bright women along with her. Uh, some are lecturers, some are professionals, and so on. And they interact very well. They are very good friends. Some they knew each other in school, others they met. And she saw the best thing, she can't do it alone. She got them and start coming out with pet ideas mm. and so on, just to assist the government in trying to. And what we did, we didn't allow her to interfere with the day-to-day -day running of government. Mm. Uh, I had a civil servant, professional civil servant, who serves as a liaison between her and other institutions of the state. Mm. If she wants anything, this is the man you will hold. He is, because he belongs to the system, Yes, he is a civil servant. Where she is going out of limits, he says, no, madam, this is not, this is not the way we do it. We do it. If you want this, this is the process. This, and that worked very well and it reduced a lot of burden on me. May her soul continue to rest in peace. Amen. We all came from various roots, and these roots are in rural areas, indeed. Of course, you have the rural settings. From the rural settings, the development came in, and it became towns, cities. You know? um, having had that kind of feel, that experience of a rural setting, not that rural though, and maybe I have a very kind of uh, special feelings to help the women, knowing very well how much burden they carry, knowing very well that they need to know, they need to be educated, they need to participate, they need to have 
good things of life. With all this in my mind, uh, and when God brought my husband to the position of being a president, I said, oh, thank God I have this chance now to address the issues of these rural people. And that's what we did. We gathered um, like minds to do this program in alleviating the sufferings, poverty level of our people. General Ibrahim Badamusiba Bangida, yes, you're retired, but from the look of things, not tired. I mean, I know that there are hordes of people waiting out there to see you, even as I'm taking this time with you. How do you carry on? I mean, how do you get along with your, in your day-to-day -day activities? By trying to have timings for everything, mm. and regulate it and stick to it, but it's not easy to keep to those timings. Uh, by nature, I like sitting down with people, having discussions, chatting, and so on and so forth. And that keeps me going. Mm. But like you rightly observe, getting old. <laughs> I must say, you wear your age well, because you really, you don't look it. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Now, before I let you go, there's this thing that has always been in my head, and Somehow, I came in here today and saw a different look. All, all, all of these times I've heard about your home, it's been said to be a mansion that contains like 300 rooms and all whatnot. And I came in, all I see is uh, corridors, living rooms and... Just like any other. Yes. So I'm wondering, where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody asked the same question. So I told him, there are no 50 rooms in this house. Mm. He laughed. I said, but if you want, I can let you go. People will take you. You will find it, there is only enough rooms for me, my wife, and children. Children. That's all. So it's perception. This is what we were talking earlier about the Nigerian. If you say, there are five rooms here. He said, no, it's 500. And you can swear that he, he was, he counted the 500. <laughs> That's a typical Nigerian. Oak. Nigerian. Well, I must say it's been an honor spending this time. And with I you. will also want to ask you, Please. are you any, relate, any relation with Adeniji Adele? Very much so, sir. You are part of that family? Yes, sir. I will shake you. Thank you very much, sir. Please sit down. Thank you, sir. When I had the name, I said, no, this rings. Are you in politics? Did you go into politics? No, what? no, just a broadcaster. I just like sitting in front of the camera and talking to people like you. Mm, but you come from a very influential family. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I know Lagos very well. Yeah, right? I know. I know. You are a small girl. At that time. In fact, when I was in secondary school, because I schooled in FGC Mina here. Is it? Yes. That was when I got um, my first physical glimpse of you. Well, so you are a citizen of Mina. You can see that. Uh, but if they tell you you are from Mina, you will break somebody's head, is it? No. Why should I? Because you are a Nigerian. No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Incidentally, sir, it's your birthday today, and um, we share the same birthday. So, happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. And you must be a lucky woman to have the same birthday with... You are a Leo then, isn't you? Yes, it? I am lioness. a Leo. Yes, a lioness. Happy Th birthday, thank sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you.
it's been an honor spending this time with you on Thank Executive you Discuss. Much. Thank you so much, sir. And um, well, we wish you the very best. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. I have spent this lovely, wonderful time with a man that I don't know where, you know, all these misconceptions came from. But sitting down and sharing this precious moment with him, I have gotten to understand the man, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida, IBB. I'm sure that you've learned so much from this conversation because I'm sure that a lot of the myths about him must have been debunked in this conversation. Let's do this again, same time, same station on the network service of the NTA next week on Executive Discuss. Till then, I remain Ololadi Adinijadili. Have faith in Nigeria, and it can only get better. Bye-bye.